Has anyone here today ever, ever done, I think I've asked this question before, but I'm gonna ask it again. Has anyone here ever done the Ancestry.com uh, testing? Anybody? Let me just hear from you if you've done that, okay? Okay, so y'all got some messed up people in your family because you don't want nobody to know that you did the Ancestry.com. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. You know, the thing where they, they like send you a package, you spit in the tube, you send the tube off to, you know, Area 51 or wherever it goes, and then they send it back to you with these results or they email you with the results of like, hey, here's the people that are in your family. Here is like what you are, you know, back in the day where your family came from. Um, you, you get to know who your great, great grandfather is, okay? Uh, has anyone ever done that and you found some like crazy stuff in your family? Anybody? Okay, we got a few crazy people in the house. That's what's up. Okay, I love that. I love that. Yeah, my, uh, my aunt about this time last year uh, did that same thing for my family. And it's one of those few things where uh, it's interesting only if you have somebody that is famous in your family or you have someone that is just like a psychopath in your family. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not very interesting when it's just like a bunch of people. It's interesting if you have George Washington in your family. It's not as interesting if you have George Coleman, okay? Like, that's not as interesting. And uh, all of us, we have like come from places. So my family did this last year on my dad's side of the family and it came back pretty straightforward for my family. I found out that I was white, okay? Um, surprise there, uh, with, a little, with a little less than 20% Native American Cherokee. Come on somebody, okay? Uh, all right, there it is. Um, so that's on my dad's side. I found out other than that, my family is, is pretty normal. And I even asked my aunt before, like when I was talking to her about this, I asked her, I said, uh, looking at the family tree, because I didn't, I didn't care necessarily about the family tree. I just wanted to know like the crazy people in the family tree, you know? I wanted to know about the famous people in the family tree. So I asked her, I was like, is there anything ex extra interesting or, or pretty straightforward, just normal people? AKA, did we have any extreme crazies or extreme famouses, okay? That's the question I asked my aunt. And then something really cool happened. We found out on my granddad's side that Austin Coleman, that's me, Austin Coleman's father, what well, is, he's still alive, <laughs> is Ronnie Coleman. His dad is Ronald Coleman, whose father was Charles, whose father was Worth, that's a name for you, whose father was Brooks, whose father was McRae, not McRib, whose father was Harris, whose father was Eldridge, whose father was Bowling, whose father was Rolf, get this, and I've told you this before, but listen, whose mother was Pocahontas. Is that crazy? Okay, so <laughs> have you ever heard the wolf cry at the... Blue corn moon, or does anyone know what a blue corn moon is, by the way? Um, <laughs> so this is what I've been told, and so this is what I believe, okay? So my great, 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 great grandmother was Pocahontas. She went by Pocahontas Coleman. Disney leaves that out, okay? Um, <laughs> Genealogy, genealogy is something that's honestly boring to look at for other people unless there is something interesting on the famous side or interesting on the crazy side. Something shady, something crazy, something amazing. But the reality today is that you come from a long line of somebodies. You may not know all the somebodies you come from. Unfortunately, in this day and age, like we, we might know our great grandparents' names and then it just kind of gets fuzzy from there. But you come from a long line of somebodies. And in our 2021 bubble, I think a lot of us, we're in it for me and maybe here's my parents and my grandparents, but man, we forget the people that came before us so quickly, don't we? We just forget the people. And what's interesting is the people that didn't forget who came before them were the Hebrew people. See, the Hebrew people, the ancient Hebrew people, the Jews were very conscious of who was in their family. It meant a whole lot to them. 
It meant more to them than just some kind of fun party game where I can say, yeah, you know what? My great, 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 great grandmother is Pocahontas. Like it meant a whole lot to the Jewish people. Who their parents were and where they came from was very, very, very important to them. It would at times dictate who they could or couldn't become. It would at times dictate who they would or wouldn't become what they would be allowed to do or what they wouldn't be allowed to do, what kind of bloodline they came from. So it was important that Matthew, the one that is writing the gospel of Matthew, the, the Hebrew man that wrote the gospel of Matthew, it was important that he started off his account of Jesus with the genealogy of Jesus. In fact, this is one of my favorite, like this is like our Christmas series, okay? And one of my favorite things talking about the Christmas story is not just the birth of Jesus, which is amazing. It's not just the virgin birth, which is amazing. It's not just that they were pushed out of, you know, a hotel, a hospital into a manger. It's not just how God showed up. One of my favorite stories in all of the New Testament about the Christmas story is the genealogy of Jesus. And what most of us do is we just skip through the ancestry.com of Jesus. We get to Matthew chapter one and we see verses one through 17 of he begat he, he begat who, he begat them, they begat those. Like we, we skip through that because we don't care as much about genealogy as the Jewish people did. But it was very important that Matthew would start off that way because it was foretold, it was predicted, it was prophesied that Jesus would be born in the lineage, that he would be born in the bloodline of David. And so Matthew, being the good Jew that he is, knowing all the prophecies, knowing the Old Testament, he went to build his case to show the world that Jesus came from where he was predicted to come from. And today, I want to look at a passage of scripture that if you started reading Matthew chapter 1, you might get really bored and fall asleep at the ancestry.com of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1. Verse one, we're gonna read the genealogy of Jesus. This may be the most boring thing you've ever read in church, but stick with me, okay? If you're gonna stick with me, just say, I am. I am. All right, Matthew one, verse one, it says this. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram. I'm about to speed talk through this, okay? Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, or if you're in the south, Salmon. Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. I love how Matthew just kind of squeezes that in there. Hey, just so you know, like it was Uriah's wife, you know, remember David had him killed? Okay. Uh, Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Joham, Joham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Yeah. Yeah. After the exile to Babylon, I was like waiting for y'all to clap at like my, my talking. Okay. <laughs> Jeconiah was the father of Shiltiel. Shiltiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Abihud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathen. Mathen, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. And verse number 23, I love it, premature, but I love it. <laughs> verse 23, and then Annie lead this clap, okay? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Yeah. The word of the Lord, okay. <laughs> now, that was, um, let's just, can we be honest today? 
the genealogy of Jesus on its face is really boring. Like if you went and you read my genealogy, uh, like without having any context, you read my genealogy and my lineage without knowing any of the stories that accompany, accompany the names, it would be very, very boring. But when you start to dig into the genealogy of Jesus, you start to realize that there's a lot more than meets the eye. Christmas trees are kind of like genealogies. Christmas trees are a little bit boring when they're just a Christmas tree with no decorations. How many people, you already have your Christmas tree up in your house, okay? Who doesn't have their Christmas tree up in your house? Let's go, whoa, y'all are behind, okay? Like all the, all the Christmas people are like judging you hardcore, okay? They came to church today to judge you for that, all right? Now, the best ornaments though, the best ornaments that go on trees, the best ornaments that go on our trees are the ones that have special meanings, right? Like the ornament that is our first Christmas, you know, it's like two little bears and like a little date, you know what I'm talking about? Or, uh, you know, the ones that are like uh, baby's first Christmas with the foot and the little weird Play-Doh thing that hardens up and cracks over time, you know what I'm talking about? The ornaments that mean the most are the ones that have the most meaning. The ornaments that, you know, you throw away and you get new all the time are just the little balls that like, you know, don't mean anything. My son, Kobe, he has no respect for ornaments at all. That, that boy runs in there and he says, ball, and just grabs it, boom, chunks it across the room. Like no respect at all for the ornaments. Now, ornaments on a tree, ornaments on a tree, they come with meanings behind the ornaments. In fact, the ornaments actually become explanations of moments in time. Now, none of Jesus' family was meant to be seen as a savior, but they were meant to be seen as explanations of a need for a savior. They were meant to be seen as explanations as to why and how you could be saved as well. Why and how God could be with you just like God was with them. And what's extraordinary and interesting about this fact in the Christmas story is not necessarily who Jesus' family members were by name, but more so who Jesus' family members were by action. Because you can read through the genealogy and you can see Abraham goes to Isaac, goes to Jacob, goes to Judah, goes to... But when you start to read into it and you start to realize that all of these names have experiences and all of these names have stories, it becomes, to become, uh, it becomes into a different story. In the life of Jesus, here's where these people came from. All right, they, they, they are almost like the ornaments on a tree. You got the tree here. And the first one that we see is good old Abraham. If you know the song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had father. Y'all some churchy people. Okay, all right. All right, so we got Abraham. Abraham is the father of our faith. Okay, y'all are still singing that song. All right, chill out a little bit. We need to get some more lost people in here. All right. Um, <laughs> Father Abraham had many sons, and one of his sons was Isaac. Y'all remember Isaac? There's not a cute song that goes with Isaac because his story is just not as interesting. Because his, his, his cool story is that uh, his dad tried to kill him. So there was that. Y'all remember that? Abraham offering Isaac to the Lord. And then the Lord provided a ram in the bush. The Lord provides. Okay. And then you got Jacob. Y'all remember Jacob? which is great. Uh, Jacob, if you're named Jacob in the house, then your name also means heel grabber. Okay, way to go. That's, that's awesome. Jacob uh, was the son of Isaac. And uh, in fact, Jacob, I don't know if you've ever noticed or not, but Jacob doesn't deserve to be in this lineage. Do you know this? Jacob actually uh, was not the one that deserved the birthright. It was Esau. But Esau sold his birthright for a cup of stew, okay? Uh, that's a different story. You can go read that and get your mind blown, okay? You got Jacob, and then from Jacob, we got Judah. Now, Judah, his big claim to fame was that he wasn't Joseph. <laughs> Any siblings feel that way? It's like, yep, I'm Austin, but I'm not Madison, you know? Not bitter. That was Judah's big claim 
to fame. And then you got Judah who leads to Tamar. Tamar was Judah's um, daughter-in-law. And uh, there's a very interesting story about Tamar and Judah that we'll get to in uh, just a minute, okay? Because uh, some of the stuff that's in the Bible is just like, are you sure that's in the Bible? You know, like that was their story. And then from Tamar, you get to Rahab and Rahab, what's interesting about Rahab is that Rahab was brought into the family of God. She was not a Hebrew by birth. She was brought into the family of God. And this is the, the genealogy of Jesus. And then from there, we skip down and we see Ruth and Ruth gets into the family and she's great. And the tree is starting to, to take form a little bit. And then we finally get to King David. Somebody give a hand clap for King David. Okay. That's what the, that's what the Jews would do. They would clap. They loved them some David and they were hopeful that one day the Messiah would come and would rule like David. And the Messiah would come and he would bring a sword and a spear, but instead the Messiah came bringing a hammer and nails. And they were hopeful that he would show up like David. David led to Solomon and uh, Solomon, the wisest man to ever read. One time I was driving down the interstate uh, and I switched seats with a girl while we were driving down the interstate. And I was a dumb college kid and we did this. And uh, the leader of this internship came up to me and he put his finger in my chest. He said, son, that wasn't wise. You know, there's a whole book in the Bible about wisdom. Go get some. And I was like, all right, cool. So Solomon <laughs> wrote Proverbs. And if you're not wise, you can go read that. Uh, and then Solomon, we're gonna skip way down to uh, Joseph. Joseph was the earthly father of Jesus and uh, he was a carpenter and he taught Jesus how to be a carpenter. Don't you find it interesting that Jesus came to planet earth with one mission in mind and that was salvation to seek and to save that which was lost. And the 30 years before his public ministry, his earthly father was training him to work with wood and ultimately he would get up on a wooden cross and he would lay down his life for yours and for mine. It was like the Lord was preparing him. And then we have... Mary, Mary, we all love Mary, right? Mother Mary, Hail Mary, all those things. We don't do that here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Mary, teen mom, Mary, she was uh, the virgin that God chose, get this, that God chose to carry his very son. How crazy is that? that he saw that Mary was fit to, to raise the very son of God. And what I find interesting is that Matthew didn't include these people to show you that they were royalty and that they can save you. He, he included them to show you, to show me that Jesus came from messed up people for messed up people. He included all of this genealogy. I believe that the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew to write down on, on this, on this, in this book we now call Matthew and collect this story of Jesus together. I believe the Holy Spirit inspired him and he led him to write down the genealogy, not so we would see how good they are, but so that we could see how bad they were and we can see that Jesus came from messed up people for messed up people. Yeah. That Jesus didn't come from perfect people he came from messed up people. So my question to you is, who's messed up today? Come on. It's okay to be messed up. We're all messed up. And we don't say it out of joy of being messed up. Like, yep, you should have seen what I did last night, Pastor. I'm real messed up. We don't say it out of joy of being messed up. No, we say it out of joy of knowing that there's a Savior that came from a bunch of messed up people for messed up people just like me and just like you. Well, we say that we are messed up, that we are sinners, that we are unrighteous because we know the one that is righteous. The one that came from a family tree is messed up as this. See, in this story, I think that we need to see two realities from the genealogy of Jesus, two realities that this Ancestry.com of Jesus shows us. 
Number one, if you're taking notes, if you got a journal on your way in, I hope you did. Uh, we're gonna be walking through devotionals over the next three weeks. That's gonna be so helpful for your spiritual growth and mine. Right, number one, God works through real people, not just ideal people. And somebody said, amen. He works through real people, not just ideal people. See, this never says Abraham, uh, but he was too messed up. Did you catch that? It never says it would have been so-and-so, but he was just too far gone. It never says, and it never attaches the sin of the person and the genealogy. You know what it shows us? It shows us that Jesus didn't come from righteous people because if he came from only perfect righteous people, it may lead us to believe that he is only for perfect righteous people. See, here's what I find interesting is that when you revisit the tree, okay, and uh, some of you may not be able to see this. I don't know if they're going to put it on the screen or not. But when you revisit the, screen, the, the, the tree, you can see that Abraham and his story, when you flip it over, Abraham wasn't just the father of the faith. Abraham was also a giant liar. Some interesting stories about Abraham and how he would visit different kingdoms. In fact, Abraham offered his wife to be slept with so that he wouldn't be killed. A giant liar. Today, we're like, man, Abraham, like, canceled. <laughs> Abraham. Isaac, he wasn't just the second born. He wasn't just the, the next one ready to go. In fact, Isaac was just a terrible parent. Isaac preferred Esau over Jacob. He was a terrible parent. And then we got, let's see, we got Jacob here. Jacob, the hill grabber, the cheater. Jacob was a cheater. He cheated out Esau from his birthright and he, we follow Jacob all throughout his life and he continues to fall into this pattern of cheating and cheating and cheating to get his way out of different situations. Then you see Judah, get this, he was just not Joseph. <laughs> not Joseph. And I don't know, maybe you walked in here today and like you're the favorite child because you know parents don't really have a favorite, but you know, they got a favorite. You know what I'm saying? Um, and maybe you walked in here today and like in your job or in your family or wherever, fill in the blank, you have a feeling that, you know what? I'm just not them. That was in Jesus' family. And then you got Tamar. Tamar was deceptive. She was deceptive. She was a liar. She was a cheater. In fact, what's interesting about Judah and, and Tamar is that uh, Tamar was his daughter-in-law, but Tamar also deceived Judah into sleeping with her because she was upset with him. And Judah, he was not just not Joseph, he was also an adulterer because he went and got a prostitute and he didn't realize he was so clouded, he didn't realize that the prostitute was his daughter-in-law. This is in Jesus' genealogy. These are Jesus' genes, baby. Mess up people, man. All right. Then we got Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute. She was unabashed about it. She, she, she was a prostitute, and that's how she made her living. She was a prostitute. Then we got David, King David. Oh, King David, the perfect one. King David, we love King David. He was an adulterer. And not just an adulterer, and we're going to talk more about King David next week. He was an adulterer, he was a liar, he was a hypocrite, and yet Scripture says that he was after God's own heart. Man, how do you have that dichotomy? David, if you're not familiar with this story, David saw Bathsheba bathing on her roof, and he fell in lust so badly that as the king, he asked her to come over, he slept with her, impregnated her, and then to try to cover it up, he goes and he sends Uriah, her husband, uh, home to sleep with her so that it would look like Uriah, Uriah impregnated her. And Uriah was such a good man, he refused to sleep with his wife while they were at war. And so King David sent Uriah to the front lines to be killed. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. He was a hypocrite. And then, let's see, we got over here, we got Ruth. She was an outsider. She wasn't a part of the family. She was an outsider. She was coming in from the, on the outside. And maybe you feel like you're an outsider today, whether it's in the faith of Christianity or you feel like an outsider in your own home or you feel like an outsider wherever it is. Guess what? That's in Jesus' genes too. Then we got 
Who do we got here? Solomon, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived was also one of the dumbest men to ever live. <laughs> and in Ecclesiastes, we read all throughout that, that whole book, you get to see a really wise man understand his really dumb decisions. He gave away his heart. And then we got uh, Joseph and Joseph is a little bit similar to some of the other ones. He was just a carpenter. It's funny, you read the story uh, all throughout the gospels and you say, it, one, of, one of the passages says something along the lines of, isn't this Jesus, the carpenter's son? He's just a carpenter. How would Jesus know anything? He's just a carpenter. And then you got Mary, the goat teen mom, greatest teen mom of all time. But that was her story. See, Mary... Yes, was a virgin and she conceived of the Lord. But listen, like everyone around her saw her just as a teen mom. They didn't see her in the same way that God saw her. And it shows us knowing some of the backgrounds of some of these people, it shows me and it should show you that Jesus came from a bunch of messed up people for a bunch of messed up people. He didn't come from perfect people. He didn't come from perfect, for perfect saviors. He came from messed up people. My Jesus came from a lineage of sinners. He came from a lineage of messed up real people, not perfect people, but real people. That's why in Romans chapter five, verse eight, it says that while you were still a sinner, Christ Jesus died for you. While you were still a sinner, Rahab, while you were still a sinner, David, while you were still a sinner, Austin, he came for you then, not when you got fixed up, not when you got better, not when you got your life together, but in the middle of your mess, in the middle of your sin, in the middle of your dysfunction, that's the very place where God wants to meet you. Amen. He came from messed up people for messed up people. And I think today somebody needs to hear that your past doesn't have the power to decide whether or not God repurposes you for his glory. Preach that. <laughs> your past does not decide. Your past cannot dictate whether the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ, who got up on the cross to die for your sins, it does not dictate, it cannot decide whether God uses you in the future. I don't care if you've been in and out of prison. I don't care what you've done in your past. I don't care how many people you've slept with. Listen to me. I don't care any of that stuff. Your addictions, your chains, the things that have held you back. Listen to me. God can use you. Amen. If God could use Abraham, if God could use Isaac, if God could use Jacob, what's keeping him from using you? Yeah. It's not your past. I can tell you that much. Somebody needs to hear that the family line of Jesus contained morally outcast people. That is a politically correct way of saying some cray crays, messed up people that they needed a savior, just like you, just like me. So if you got some messed up people in your family, the good news is that God still wants to use you. I'm talking about like, if you're from a small town and your dad was the local drunk, you know, and so when people see you, all they see is what your father did. I'm talking about you were raised by a mom that, that the city just, people in the city hated, people in your town hated because she was always just chatty Cathy, you know, the Karen back in the day. And all they see is her. Listen to me, that doesn't dictate whether God uses you or not. Your family, your lineage does not dictate whether God uses you or not because God used Jesus and this was his family lineage. In fact, I don't know that there's anybody <laughs> in the world ever that has a lineage as messed up as Jesus. Can we just be real for a minute? Like these people are messed up, man. Really messed up. Like you think that you have daddy issues or whatever, like listen. Go talk to Isaac and Abraham. Abraham tried to sacrifice that boy. Like, listen, it was great that the Lord provided the, the, the ram in the bush, but man, you know that was an awkward trip back home. It's like, dad, were you really gonna sacrifice me? Like, what's, we need to talk, you know? <laughs> Somebody needs to hear today that the family line of Jesus contained racially diverse 
people. Jesus has some non-Jews in his heritage. Why is that important for us to know? Why is that important for us to point out? It's important because Jesus wasn't just for the Jews. Jesus isn't just for the Middle, Middle Eastern man. Jesus is not just for the white girls. Jesus is not just for the black guys. Jesus is for anybody and everybody that will acknowledge that I have sinned, that I have fallen short of the glory of God and I need freedom and I need grace from the only one that can give it and his name is Jesus. It's not based on skin color. It's not based on where you're from. It's based on grace in Jesus. And what's funny is that Matthew doesn't put in the sin. He puts in the name. Here's why that's important. The enemy knows your name, but he calls you by your sin. (laughs) But Jesus knows your sin and he calls you by your name. The enemy knows your name. But why is it that the thoughts that you get, the condemnation that you feel is never saying, Austin, you did this, but rather it's calling you by your sin. Jesus doesn't call you by your sin. He calls you by your name. He knows it, but he still calls you by your name. You know what this is called? I think this is called grace. Grace. Oh, you're a liar? There's grace for that, Abraham. (laughs) Oh, oh, you're a bad dad. There's grace for that, Isaac. Oh, you're a cheater. There is grace for that, Jacob. Oh, you feel like an outsider. There is grace for that, Ruth. Oh, you've got a messy past. There is grace for that, Rahab. Oh, you're an adulterer. There is grace for that, David. Oh, you've given away your heart. There is grace for that, Solomon. Oh, you're just a carpenter. You're just a dad. You're just a mom. You're just a fill in the blank. There is grace for that, Joseph. The grace of God isn't waiting on your sin to define you. It's leveled the playing field and it is just waiting on you to come home. The grace of God has leveled the playing field. There is no one here better than anyone else here. Regardless of your past, regardless of your mommy and daddy, there's no one here greater than the next. It's because of the grace of God, the grace of God. All have fallen short of the glory of God and it is the grace of God that fills the gap. Let me pause here quickly to explain uh, what I believe should be the reaction and the response to receiving grace. Because we can talk about grace all day, like grace, I love grace, you know, Jesus, grace, you know, I deserve something bad, but God's gonna give me something good. Praise the Lord, amen. But I believe there's a response and there's a reaction needed for grace. To truly receive grace, get this, means if you've truly received grace, here's how you'll know if you truly receive grace. Are you ready for this? Let me get a SpongeBob, I'm ready. If you've truly received grace, it means that you will dispense grace back to others. To those that have been forgiven much, they forgive much. To those that have been loved much, they love much. To those that have been given much grace, they give much grace. And when you understand the grace that you've received from Jesus, whom he, he did not need to give you grace, we did not deserve the grace from him, you start to give grace to others. You can't help but to give grace to others. We don't assume intentions onto others. <laughs> it's a big one assuming intentions. You you don't have an offended spirit when you've received grace. What, why, why? Because your default is grace when you realize that grace you've received. Your default is generosity when you realize the generosity that you've received. Your default should be forgiveness when you realize the forgiveness that you have received from the Lord. And I believe that those are the two biggest problems, two of the biggest problems in our generation, like, like you know, the, the generation that's coming and the next decade, I believe those are the two biggest problems quickly is that we are quick to assume intentions and we are quick to be offended. Why? Because we lack an understanding of grace. 
an understanding of grace that goes beyond our head and it moves into our soul, into our spirit, into our heart. We have to understand that we've received grace and we dispense grace. And this is what makes Christians different. This is what should make me different. This is what should make you different. In fact, it's what will separate Christians from non-Christians in the next decade. It will make you more obviously a Christian in the next decade if you will experience grace. It's grace. Is that we give grace. We give grace. We expense grace. We, we give grace to other people even when they don't deserve it. We give grace. We, we don't cancel people. We don't assume intentions. We forgive. We show mercy. We give crazy grace. We refuse to be offended. Why? Because we've been shown so much grace. If anyone deserves to be offended, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who took on my sin and your sin. He deserves to be offended. He deserves to assume intentions, but he doesn't. He gives grace. And the very thing that is going to mark Christianity over the next decade and whether or not we are obviously Christian or we stick to cultural Christianity or we just give it up entirely is that we will be a people of grace. Amen. That when the world starts to push people away, when the world starts to deem people unsavable, when the world starts to give up on people, Christians don't give up on people. Yes, we believe in justice. The Lord believes in justice. Yes, we believe in truth. The Lord believes in truth, but we bring grace to every situation. Amen. Said, bro, you know what, Abraham, guess what, bro? You are a liar, truth. But you know what? I'm not gonna give up on you because the Lord didn't give up on me. Oh, you know what, Rahab, you know, you're a prostitute. We might ought to fix that, okay? But you know what? I'm not gonna give up on you because the Lord didn't give up on me. Amen. I'm not gonna give up on you because the Lord Jesus Christ didn't give up on me. These people in the genealogy of Jesus deserve to be imprisoned. They deserve to be canceled. They deserve to be wiped from history, but they're not. Why? Grace, grace. See, Jesus came from messed up people for messed up people. And ultimately, I believe that the Christmas tree is great because it shows us that Jesus came from a messed up and broken family tree to go to another messed up and broken tree called the cross. He came from a messed up and broken family tree in order to show you and to show me the cross, the other tree that he was going to. That Jesus didn't come just for good people. He came for the Rahabs. He came from the Davids. He came for the Austins. He came for the Sarahs. He came for the liars. He came for the cheaters. He came for the adulterers. He came for the prostitutes. He came for the fill in the blank, whatever you are, the judgmental. He came for the Pharisees. He came for the all of the above. Jesus came for you. Jesus came for me. But Jesus doesn't just make you good. Jesus makes you forgiven. It's better than good, baby. It's better than good. It's forgiven. After you're forgiven, he starts to change your life and you start to see goodness come from your life, not because of you, but because of him. And what's so great about this story and what's so great about the genealogy of Jesus is that yes, Abraham was messed up. He was a giant liar, but Abraham was restored. Isaac, yeah, he was a messed up parent, but you know what? Isaac was restored. Jacob, he was a cheater, but you know what? He was called by his name, why? Because he was restored. Judah, Judah, he was not Joseph and he maybe didn't get all the things he wanted, but Judah, he was restored by the Lord. We, we see even further, we, we got Rahab here. Yes, she was a prostitute, but Rahab was restored. King David, he was messed up. He was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because David was restored, not by being good, but by being forgiven. We got Tamar who was messed up just like all the rest, but Tamar was restored. You got Ruth. She was an outsider. She felt like an outcast, but Ruth was restored. Solomon, restored. Joseph, restored. Mary, restored. Why? Because God specializes in restoring the things that people see as unrestorable. Amen. 
I hope there's people here today under the sound of my voice. You walked in here and you feel defeated and you feel like you can't move on. You feel like you can't be forgiven. You feel like people could never move on. Listen to me, I got good news for you today. No matter what people think about you, no matter where you find yourself on the, the genealogy in your life, no matter where you find yourself as unrestorable, the great restorer is Jesus. He didn't die to make you good, baby. He died to make you forgiven. That's the truth. That's the truth. He didn't die to make you churchy. He didn't die to make you a giver. We're about to give in a moment. He didn't die to make you generous. He didn't die to make you a good person. He died to make you forgiven. To give grace so that you could give the grace he had given to you. The heads bowed and eyes closed.